Barker Rollis Foundations of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing, 8th edition, chapter 31, Older Adults. Key terms and concepts, adult daycare, advanced directives, ageism, agnosia, aphasia, apraxia, late life mental illness, medication reconciliation, patient self-determination act, polypharmacy, prescribing cascade. An aging population is a global phenomenon that is occurring at record-breaking rate, especially in developing countries. In the United States, this increase in the proportion of older adults affects the economy, health, and social services. According to the Administration on Aging, the number of individuals over 65 years old has grown by 24.7% between 2003 and 2013. That's a lot. Those individuals over 85 years old are projected to more than double from 6 million in 2013 to 14.6 million in 2040. Among this cohort, fastest growing subgroups are racial and ethnic minorities. Individuals and minority groups represent about 21% of those who are 65 years or older. This number is expected to increase to nearly 29% by 2030. The number of centarians, those individuals 100 years and older, has more than doubled since 1980 to over 67,000 in 2013. Figure 13.1 shows a projected rate of growth in people 65 and older till 2060. As people live longer, they are more likely to deal with chronic illness and disability. At least 92% of older adults have at least one chronic disease and 77% have at least two. The most common chronic illnesses are heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes which are responsible for almost two-thirds of all deaths each year. The risk of developing a chronic illness dramatically increases with age. Individuals 75 and older are the most prone to chronic illnesses and functional disabilities. After age 85, there is a 1 in 3 chance of developing dementia, immobility, incontinence, or other age-related disability. Figure 31.2 illustrates selected medical conditions and residential care residents based on facility size. Women generally outlive men. This has significant ramifications for society at large and for the healthcare system in particular. Not only do women make up the large proportion of older adults, they also use healthcare services more frequently than men and seek services earlier, even for minor conditions. Chronological age is an arbitrary indicator of function because there are significant variables that contribute to the health and functioning of older adults. For example, individuals who live beyond 100 years old experience a progressive delay in the age of onset of impaired physical and cognitive functioning, age-associated diseases, and overall morbidity. Common classifications for people 65 years and older is young old, 65 to 74 years, middle old, 75 to 84 years, old, old, 85 to 100 years, centarians, 100 to 104 years, semi-super centarians, 105 to 109 years, super centarians, 110 to 119 years. Aging is accompanied by limited regenerative abilities and increased susceptibility to disease syndromes and sickness. The last years of life are often punctuated by losses. Some obvious and some subtler. While retirement may be welcome, it still represents the loss of a career, possibly self-identity. Losses may be people, a spouse, children, and friends. As the ability to care for themselves becomes more difficult, familiar surroundings and independence may be lost in favor of assisted living or residential care. Older adults experience diminished senses, taste, smell, hearing, and sight. Cognitive decline and physical health problems weigh on an individual's day-to-day -day function. Mental health issues related to aging. Late life mental illness. Older adults who develop late life mental illness are less likely than young adults to be accurately diagnosed and receive mental health treatment. Psychiatric issues such as depression, cognitive deficits, and prolonged grieving are not a normal part of aging. Diagnosing and treating psychiatric disorders prolongs the individual's ability to remain independent and increases the ability to take the lead in personal choices. Depression. Mood disorders are often under-identified because of 
or morbid medical conditions. Depression is quite common after cardiac events and strokes, but care providers can confuse it with dementia or delirium. A careful systemic assessment is necessary to properly distinguish among the three. The cardinal differences include the following. Onset of mental status change and course of illness. Level of consciousness, attention span. Aging and suicide risks. The risk of suicide for men increases with age, particularly for white men ages 65 and older, whose risk is seven times that of females in the same age. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, 80% of all suicides in those 65 and older are white males. In 2014, the highest suicide risk, 19.3%, was among people 85 years or older. The second highest rate, 19.2%, occurred in those between 45 and 64 years of age. Even though the known suicide rate among older adults is high, especially among white non-Hispanic males, suicide in this group is probably underreported. The CDC estimates for every one completed suicide there are four suicide attempts in this older adult population. The numbers also do not reflect those who passively or indirectly commit suicide by abusing alcohol, starving themselves, overdosing or mixing medications, stopping life-sustaining drugs, getting into auto accidents, or simply losing the will to live. Treating depression is cost-effective, saves lives, and decreases health care expenditures. Chapter 25 provides an in-depth discussion of suicide. Early identification of risk factors and treatment for depression are key measures for suicide prevention. Risks for suicide include diagnosable psychiatric illness, such as psychosis, anxiety, substance use, previous suicide attempts, psychological alterations, personality, emotional reactivity, impulsiveness, stressful life events. Other risk factors include access to weapons, access to large doses of medication, and chronic or terminal illness. Some protective factors include spiritual beliefs, being married, personal resilience, perception of social family support, and having children. Selective uh, SSRIs are the first line of treatment for depression. This category is often helpful if anxiety, worry, or rumination is problematic. If pain or diabetic neuropathy is a comorbid condition, SNRIs are often prescribed. Treatment-resistant depression can be treated with psychostimulants such as methylphenidate. ECT is also a good alternative approach for depression, particularly in older adults who may not tolerate medication or fail to improve. Anxiety disorders. In older adults, anxiety disorders are often undiagnosed and prevalence estimates vary greatly. The most common anxiety disorder in this age group is generalized anxiety disorder. One unique anxiety-related problem in older adults is the fear of falling. This problem even has its own acronym, FOF. Its impact on keeping individuals homebound is similar to agoraphobia because FOF results in activity restriction. Psychosocial risk factors for anxiety include childlessness, low socioeconomic status, and having experienced trauma. Other risk factors include being female, single, and having multiple medical conditions. Protective factors include social support, spiritual beliefs, physical activity, cognitive stimulation, and having coping strategies. First-line treatment for anxiety disorders in all age groups include older adults, as SSRIs, along with cognitive behavioral therapy. Benzos such as Ativan, Xanax, and Valium are also used to treat anxiety, but are often prescribed inappropriately in older adults. Using this class of drugs may result in increased falls, fractures, mental decline, and delirium. When used in low doses, these problems are less likely, but it is better to avoid the drugs in this class if at all possible. Benzos have recently been implicated in an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease for individuals with chronic use. Chapter 15 discusses anxiety disorders in greater detail. Delirium. Delirium is a time-limited medical condition caused by physiological changes, usually due to an identifiable underlying pathology. Fluctuations in consciousness and changes in cognition develop over a short period of time. Fortunately, disorientation in older adults may be labeled as dementia and disregarded. It is crucial to obtain data from family or caregivers about a baseline level of functioning. A patient who is newly confused, falling, disrobing, and fighting with staff should be assessed for delirium. Asking family members questions such as, 
Has your mother been shopping and cooking for herself? Does she pay her own bills? Or does she ever get lost when driving? They give subtle clues about whether changes are acute or have been coming on slowly. Treatment of delirium begins with identifying the cause. You may ask, is your father taking any new medication? Or has your father fallen or hit his head recently? The delirium may be due to drug reactions or toxicity, infections, electrolyte or metabolic disturbances, anemia, thyroid dysfunction, vitamin deficiency, stroke, and a multitude of other problems. A multidisciplinary approach is often helpful to identify caus causation. Pharmacists are helpful in identifying possible drug-related effects. Geriatricians provide a comprehensive approach to physical assessment. Psychiatric consult can provide mental status evaluation and recommendations for treatment of behaviors. Neurocognitive disorders. The most common neurocognitive disorder are Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease. Both are characterized by functional decline, aphasia, difficulty finding words, apraxia, difficulty carrying out motor functions, agnosia, failure to recognize objects, and disturbances in executive functioning, organizing, planning, abstracting, insight, judgment. Changes in executive functioning may result in forgetting how to make old family recipes or the inability to pay bills. Tragically, limited insight and judgment often lead to increased vulnerability to exploitation. Chapter 23 presents a more complete picture of delirium and dementia and associated care. Alcohol. Although heavy drinking tends to decline with age, it continues to be a serious problem and may result in serious problems for older adults. The antecedents to late onset alcohol use problems are often related to environmental conditions and may include retirement, widowhood, and loneliness. Previous work, family responsibilities, and marriage may have been protected in keeping a person with vulnerability from drinking too much. Once these demands are gone and the structure of daily life is removed, there may be little impetus to stay sober. Risk factors for heavy drinking in older adults are being male and single, having less than a high school education, low income, and cigarette smoking. Additionally, depression often plays a role in increased alcohol consumption in the older adult. Identifying alcohol and substance use problems is often difficult because personality and behavioral changes frequently go unrecognized. Whenever there is a suspicion or indication that an older adult is misusing alcohol, the healthcare provider should conduct a screening test. The Michigan Alcoholism Screening Test Geriatric Version, MASK-G, is an instrument commonly used to assess older adults' alcohol use. The older person who misuses alcohol exhibits confusion, malnutrition, self-neglect, weight loss, depression, and falls. Diarrhea, urinary incontinence, decreased functional status, failure to thrive, and dementia may also be present. Long-term excessive alcohol use can lead to alcohol-induced dementia. Symptoms include impaired executive function and significant lack of insight. This is in contrast to the memory or language problems of Alzheimer's disease. Moose and colleagues conducted a study where 719 participants were followed over a 20-year span. Excessive drinking late in life was found in about 33%. Indicators of excessive use for past drinking history, reliance on substances for stress reduction, and support appears in drinking behavior. There's evidence that older adults respond to treatment as well, if not better than younger adults. Intentional brief interventions by a healthcare provider or participation in a group setting can support older adults in decreasing alcohol consumption. Group therapy along with self-help groups like AA can be effective. It is important that healthcare providers recognize and recommend these options. Pain. Pain is common among older adults and affects their sense of well-being and quality of life. Up to 85% of the older population is believed to have conditions that predispose them to pain. These conditions include arthritis, peripheral vascular disease, and diabetic neuropathy. Depression may cause or increase the perception of pain. Pain can affect the older adult's functioning and ability to perform activities of daily living, such as walking, toileting, and bathing, and especially if the pain is from musculoskeletal disease. Pain can lead to increased stress, delayed healing, decreased mobility, 
disturbances in sleep, decreased appetite, and agitation with accompanying aggressive behaviors. Chronic pain is linked to depression, low self-esteem, social isolation, and feelings of hopelessness. There is mounting evidence that treatment of pain improves mood, and treatment of mood improves pain. Wow. Barriers to accurate pain assessment. The appropriate assessment and treatment of pain in older adults may have complications. They may believe that pain is punishment for past behaviors. An inevitable part of aging, indicative of impending death, relates to serious illness, expensive to test and diagnose, or a sign of weakness. External obstacles to pain management include inadequate assessment by health professionals, complicated clinical presentation, assumptions by healthcare professionals that pain is part of aging, and communication deficits due to cognitive impairment. The use of open-ended questions such as, tell me about your pain, aches, soreness, or discomfort, yields significantly more information than use of a pain scale alone. Assess changes in behavior that indicate pain, especially in patients who have language impairment, such as dementia or stroke. Uh, unlike younger adults, older adults may underestimate pain using milder words such as discomfort, hurting, or aching. Multiple painful problems may occur together, making differentiation of new pain from pre-existing pain difficult. Sensory impairment, memory loss, dementia, and depression can add to the difficulty of obtaining an accurate pain assessment. Interviews with family members, caregivers, or friends may be helpful. And then we have that mass G. It's in a box. It's uh, pretty long, so we'll take a look at that later. Assessment tools. When pain is suspected, the nurse begins with a physical assessment for medical origins of the pain and assess the level of pain. The Long Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale is an active assessment instrument. The FACES scale shows facial expressions on a scale of 0, a smile, to 5, crying grimace. Respondents choose a face that depicts the pain they feel. People with cognitive deficits often act out due to pain. The Pain Assessment in Advanced Dementia, Pain Ad, scale evaluates the presence and severity of pain in patients with advanced neurocognitive disorders who no longer have the ability to communicate verbally. The scale evaluates five domains, breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, and consolability. The score assists the caregiver in the development of appropriate pain intervention. And here on this page we have diagrams of the Wong Baker and also the pain ad scale they were just talking about. Pain management, pharmacological pain treatments. Pain can be managed with pharmacological and alternative measures. Pharmacological pain management relies on the use of non-prescriptive and prescriptive medications, frequently based on the recommendation of the healthcare provider. Persistent pain is common among seniors, yet older adults may experience adverse drug reactions due to the age and disease-related changes in pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Careful monitoring of medication effects will help aid in avoiding over-medication or under-medication. Hepatic and renal functioning should be evaluated periodically. Non-opioids are useful for mild to moderate pain. Tylenol is the preferred non-opioid medication. However, while it relieves pain, it does nothing to reduce inflammation. Tylenol can be toxic to the liver. Maximum dose should be reduced to 50% to 75% in adults with a history of alcohol use problems or reduced hepatic function. NSAIDs work by inhibiting one or both of two enzymes involved in the production of inflammation, pain, and fever, COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1 functions to protect the lining of the stomach and intestines from the damaging effects of acid, promote blood clotting, and regulate normal kidney function. When these enzymes are inhibited, GI bleeding and nephrotoxicity are dangerous potential side effects of non-selective NSAIDs. Non-selective NSAIDs include drugs such as Motrin, Advil, Aleve, and Aspirin. A newer group of NSAIDs that selectively inhibits only one COX enzyme is called COX-2 inhibitor. Because this classification of drugs does not block COX-1, they do not cause ulcers or increase the bleeding as much as the older NSAIDs. 
Celebrex is the only COX-2 inhibitor available in the United States. Um, and then up here we have box 31.2. Um, that's also a written description of the pain ad scale. In 2015, uh, the U.S. FDA strengthened an existing warning of prescription drug labels and over-the-counter labels. This warning indicates that NSAIDs can increase the chance of a heart attack, stroke, and potentially life-threatening GI bleeding. These serious side effects can occur as early as the first weeks of using these drugs. The risk may increase the longer the NSAIDs are used and increase with higher doses. Although aspirin is also an NSAID, this warning does not apply to aspirin. Chronic pain may be treated with pain modulators such as Neurontin, Lyrica, SNRIs, and tricyclic antidepressants. Consultation with a pain management specialist is often helpful with chronic pain syndromes. Some considerations in pain management in older adults are listed in Box 313. Box 313, Tips for Pharmacological Pain Management in Older Adults. Remember that older adults often receive pain medication less often than younger adults, which results in inadequate pain relief. Compensate for this. Safe administration of analgesics is complicated because of possible interactions with drug use to treat multiple chronic disorders, nutritional alterations, and altered pharmacokinetics in older adults. Analgesics reach a higher peak and have a longer duration of action in older adults than in younger individuals. Start with one-fourth to one-half the adult dose and titrate up carefully. Give oral analgesics around the clock when initiating pain management. Administer on an as-needed basis later on as indicated by the patient's pain status. If acute confusion occurs, assess for other contributing factors before changing the medication or stopping analgesic use. Confusion in post-operative patients is associated with unrelieved pain rather than opiate use. Tylenol is an effective analgesic in older adults, although it's ineffective in reducing inflammation. There's an increased risk of end-stage renal disease with long-term use. It does not produce the increased stroke and heart attack risk or GI bleeding seen with NSAIDs. Opiates have a great, greater analgesic effect and longer duration of action for moderate to severe pain than non-opioid analgesics. Opioids should be avoided for non-cancer related chronic pain due to evidence that risks may outweigh the benefits. Risks include risk of fractures, hospitalization, and mortality. Assess bowel function daily because constipation can be a frequent side effect of opioid use. Opioids may be indicated for treating moderate to severe acute pain. Opioids are metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidneys, either unchanged or as metabolites. As the result of normal aging, renal insufficiency often occurs, making older adults susceptible to drug effects and metabolite accumulation. Initial doses of opioids should be reduced in senior patients and longer dosing intervals should be scheduled. The trend is to avoid opioids for non-cancer related chronic pain due to evidence that the risks are significant, including increased risk of fractures, hospitalization, and mortality. Furthermore, it may not even be beneficial for long-term pain. Prescribers also report a concern about misuse of opioids by family and friends. Older adults' resp response to pain treatment is improved when the patient actively participates in treatment decisions. A trusting and mutually respectful relationship with providers reduces anxiety and associated pain. Being understood supports the goal of patient-centered care. Non-pharmacological pain treatments for pain include physical therapy, vagal nerve stimulation, exercise, hydrotherapy, heat and cold packs, chiropractic, and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or TENS, yoga, biofeedback, hypnosis, acupuncture, massage, Reiki, guided imagery, reflexology, and other forms of Satanism, I'm sorry, and therapeutic touch are integrative therapies for managing pain. Herbal remedies include cayenne, capsaicin, ginger extract, echinacea, kava, and willow bark. It is important to ask older adults if they are utilizing any alternative treatments for pain relief. Pain management education is important for both patient and caregivers. Refer to Chapter 36 
for dis the full discussion of integrative therapies. It is critical for nurses to evaluate the effectiveness of pain interventions at regular intervals and to be attentive to behavioral changes or verbal responses that indicate the patient is experiencing pain. It is a common misconception to assume that the ability to perceive pain decreases with aging. No physiological changes in pain perception in older adults has been demonstrated. Healthcare concerns of older adults. Financial burden. Healthcare expenses for older adults are nearly four times higher than the expenses for the rest of the population. With the predicted growth in this population, illness prevention and maintenance of functional ability must be priorities. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 10% of those 65 or older live below the poverty level, which is $11,000. There are much higher poverty rates in Hispanic and African American older adults. Uh, Medicare Part D has reduced the financial burden of paying for medications. In 2016, Medicare Part D paid 75% of total drug costs after deductible up to $306 and a monthly premium are paid. Depending upon the plan chosen by an individual, co-payments or co-insurance is required. Once out-of-pocket and covered medication expenses reach $3,300, the coverage gap starts. People are still required to pay monthly premium during the coverage gap period. Once expenses reach $4,800, catastrophic coverage kicks in. During this period, people pay either a 5% co-insurance for covered drugs or a co-pay of $2.95 for covered generic drugs and $7.40 for covered brand name drugs, whichever is greater. Nurses need to be aware of these financial burdens that impact health practices. Education for seniors regarding the availability and use of other resources such as patient assistance programs for expensive medications is crucial. Encourage seniors to ask their physicians and pharmacists about financial assistance for medications. Local advocacy agencies like the AARP or Area Agency on Aging often have free assistance for seniors to help them select a Medicare insurance plan that will best cover their specific medications. Caregiver burden. Another phenomenon with the aging population is the increase in caregiver burden. Caregiver burden is the amount of physical, emotional, financial, and psychosocial support provided to a loved one with a chronic illness. One common scenario is a two-income family in the middle of raising children and planning for retirement who are faced with assisting aging patients, parents. Families sometimes referred to as a sandwich family, sandwiched between two generations. Another is one older adult sp spouse taking care of the other. Dwindling benefits, shorter hospital stays, limited home care options, greater life expectancy, and complicated procedures to access care have increased the need for adult children and aging spouses to provide uncompensated care to loved ones. Due to the stress of this burden, caregivers are at a risk for depression and caregiver burnout. Resources for caregivers include the following books. Mason Rabbins, The 36-Hour Day, Lust Bader, Taking Care of Aging Family Members. Agencies and associations provide helpful and up-to-date uh, information and include medication information, resources, and support groups. These rich resources can be found online. They include AARP, Alzheimer's Association, U.S. National Library of Medicine, Family Caregiver Alliance, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Caregiver Action Network, National Institute on Aging, Administration on Aging. Unfortunately, Having family caregivers is not common for older adults who have chronic psychiatric disorders. Schizophrenia and bipolar disorders often take a toll on a family member's and intimate relationships. And it is not uncommon for those with severe mental illnesses to have no family available for support as they age. Grown children may be estranged because of parents' frequent hospitalization, poor parenting ability, or paranoid symptoms. The support system of those aging with chronic mental illness becomes uh, uh, case managers, community nurses, and mental health providers. Ageism. Western cultures do not generally view growing older as a privilege, and old age does not tend to confer a revered social status upon those who have attained it. Ageism is a bias against older people based on advanced age. 
Ageism differs from other forms of discrimination in that it cuts across gender, race, religion, and socioeconomic status. You can observe the results of ageism in every level of society, financial and political support programs geared toward older adults are difficult to obtain. However, groups such as the Grey Panthers and the AARP are powerful governmental lobbying groups that fight to change this disturbing attitude. Ageism and research. Traditionally, researchers have used subjects between the ages of 18 and 65. Older adults have been excluded from clinical trials for medication being tested due to polypharmacy or having a chronic illness. Information about medications obtained from a younger, healthier population may not be generalizable to older, sicker adults. In 2012, the FDA issued guidelines that recommend a geriatric population be included in clinical trials and medications. The rationale for the, this recommendation included trial participants should be the rationale for this recommendation um, included trial participants should represent the patient population receiving the therapy. People over age 65 make up the majority of patients being treated for chronic conditions. This population has age-related physiological and the pharmacodynamics, the drug, which may influence the drug response, the dose. Looks like they failed to do some proofreading there. Healthcare decision making. Advanced directives. Since the 1960s, people have increasingly sought to participate in decision making about healthcare. In 1990, Congress passed the Patient Self Determination Act, requiring that healthcare facilities provide clearly written information for every patient, including legal rights to make healthcare decisions, especially the right to accept or refuse treatment. PSDA also establishes the right of a person to provide directions or advanced directives for clinicians to follow in the event of a serious illness. Such a directive indicates preferences for the types and amount of medical care desired. The directive comes into effect should physical or mental incapacitation prevent the patient from making health care decisions. Patients can communicate these wishes through one or more of the following instruments. One, a living will two, a directive to a physician, and three, a durable power of attorney for health care. These documents must be in writing, and the patient's signature must be witnessed. Depending on state and institutional provisions, signatures may need to be documented by a notary. Every health care facility receiving federal funds is required to have written policies, procedures, and protocols in compliance with the PSDA. The law does not specify who talks with patients about treatment decisions, but nurses often discuss these issues with patients. If the advanced directive of a patient is not being followed, the nurse is required to intervene on the patient's behalf. Although nurses may discuss options with their patients, they may not assist patients in writing advanced directives because this is considered conflict of interest. Box 31.4 lists nurses' responsibilities and the Patient Self-Determination Act of 1990. Part of nursing admission assessment. Nurses should know the laws in the state which they practice and should be familiar with the strengths and limitations of the various forms of the advanced directive. The American Nurse Association recommends that the following questions be part of the nursing admission assessment. Do you have basic information about advanced care directives including living wills and durable power of attorney? Do you wish to initiate an advanced care directive? If you have already prepared an advanced care directive, can you provide it now? Have you discussed your end-of-life choices with your family or designated surrogate and healthcare workers? All right, and the rest of this box is kind of boring legal stuff. We'll look at it later. Living will. A living will is a personal statement of how and where one wishes to die. It is activated only when the person is terminally ill and incapacitated, and a competent patient may alter a living will at any time. The question of whether an incompetent person can change a living will is addressed on a state-by-state -state basis. Executing a living will does not always guarantee its application. Directive to physician. In a directive to physician, a physician is appointed to serve as a surrogate medical decision maker, particularly in cases of terminal illness when an individual has no family. There needs to be verification of terminal illnesses by two physicians, and the patient must be competent at the time of signing. The physician must agree in writing to be the patient's agent 
It must also be one of the two physicians who made the original determination. The patient is terminally ill. Unlike the living will, the patient can revoke the directive orally at any time without regard to patient competency. Hmm. Durable power of attorney for health care. The durable power of attorney for health care is the designation of a person to act as a patient's medical decision maker. The patient must be competent when making the appointment. It must also be competent to revoke the power. Individuals do not have to be terminally ill or incompetent to allow the empowered individual to act on their behalf. Guardianship. Guardianship is a court-ordered relationship in which one party, the guardian, acts on behalf of an individual, the ward. For guardianship to be enacted, the ward must be lacking capacity to manage personal financial affairs. After an evaluation, usually by a physician or psychologist, probate court determines if guardianship is necessary. Many people with mental illness, mental retardation, traumatic brain injuries, and organic brain disorders such as dementia have guardians. It is important that healthcare workers identify patients who have guardians and communicate with the guardians when healthcare decisions are being made. The nurse's role in decision making. The nurse is often responsible for explaining the legal policy of the institution to both patient and family and can help them understand advanced directives. There are usually three common approaches to care. One, full code. All life-saving measures are initiated. Two, do not resuscitate, come for care arrest. All life-saving measures are initiated except in the case of a full cardiac arrest and intubation. Do not resuscitate, come for care only. Medical care focuses on providing pain-free quality of life and comfort-free of invasive procedures and intubation. Ethical dilemmas can occur in regard to those life or death decisions. For example, when a patient has a feeding tube and a DNRCCO status is later initiated, do we remove the feeding tube? Hospital bioethics committees can assist by looking at the situation objectively. Nursing care of older adults. Nurses encounter older adults in a variety of settings. In each of these settings, a nurse is responsible for applying the nursing process in a patient-centered way. Some nursing students are not given adequate information and are not exposed to older patients, and they may hold ageist views when beginning nursing careers. It is vital for nurses to provide respect to older patients and appreciate their wisdom and life experience. Positive attitudes towards older adults and their care can be promoted and instilled during basic nursing education. There are many theories about the process of aging from biological, genetic, psychological, and psychosocial perspectives. Box 31.5 states major theories of aging biological cellular functioning cells accumulate damage resulting in errors of replication error theory error in protein synthesis results in impaired cellular function oxidative stress theory production of free radicals increases and the body's ability to remove them decreases resulting in dna damage wear and tear theory internal and external stresses harm cells programmed aging theory biological or genetic clock plays out on genes Neuroendocrine theory, a program decline in the functioning of the nerves, endocrine, and immune systems, uh, which, where cells lose their ability to reproduce. Immunity theory, an accumulation of damage and decline in the immune system. Then you have developmental theories, Young's theory of personality, Erickson, Peck, Maslow, and Tornstam. And psychosocial, you have the role theory, activity theory, Disengagement theory, continuity theory, age stratification theory, and modernization theory. Just read the titles, not the descriptions there. Substantial literature is available regarding what shortens a life expectancy and on behaviors that predispose humans to disease. Current trends center on the concept of aging well and how aging well can be accomplished. Nursing is about maintenance of health, prevention of illness, and helping individuals with their response to disease. There is a growing focus on healthy eating, exercise, socialization, spirituality, effective coping skills, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and healthy relationships as a basis for aging well. Nurses can play a vital role in this movement as educators and advocates for health. Box 31.6 provides some facts and myths about aging that influence how society perceives the older adults. Let's take a look at that box. Facts. The senses of vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell decline with age. Muscular strength decreases with age. Muscle fibers atrophy and decrease in number. 
Regular sexual expressions are important to maintain sexual capacity and effective performance. At least 50% of restorative sleep is lost as a result of the aging process. Older adults are major consumers of prescription drugs because of high influence of chronic diseases on this population. Older adults have a high incidence of depression. Many individuals experience difficulty when they retire. Older adults are prone to become victims of crime. Older widows appear to adjust better than younger ones. Myths. Most adults past the age of 65 have dementia. Sexual interest declines with age. Older adults are unable to learn new tasks. As individuals age, they become more rigid in their thinking and set in their ways. The aged are well off and no longer impoverished. Most older adults are infirm and require help with daily activities. Most older adults are socially isolated and lonely. Uh, assessment. Nurses who work with older adults need specific knowledge about normal aging, drug interactions, and chronic disease. Those who work with older adults have mental health problems or cognitive de deficits need to have additional skills and effective communication, behavioral intervention, and recognition of how the care setting affects the older individual. The National Institutes of Health recommends a comprehensive geriatric assessment. This comprehensive assessment includes a focus on physical and mental health, functional, economic, and social status, and environmental factors that might impinge on the person's well-being. Figure 31.5 provides an example of a comprehensive geriatric assessment, and that's a big box, takes up about most of the next page. We'll look at that later. Assessment strategies with older adults. An examination and interview of an older adult conducted in unfamiliar surroundings can, help, can produce anxiety. Unlike younger patients who may be comfortable discussing personal issues, family conflicts, feelings of sadness, sexual practices, finances, and bodily functions, older adults may view these topics as private or taboo. As a result, they may be uncomfortable discussing them. It is important to respect these feelings while reviewing essential history by conducting the interview in a private area, introducing oneself and asking the patient what he or she would like to be called, establishing rapport and putting the patient at ease by sitting or standing at the same level as the patient, Ensuring that lighting is adequate and noise level is low in recognition of the fact that hearing and vision may be impaired. Using touch with permission to convey warmth, while at the same time respecting the patient's comfort level of personal touch. Summarizing the interaction, inviting feedback and questions, and thanking patients for giving their time and information. Physical assessment. A thorough assessment, including a physical assessment and diagnostic testing, must precede any treatment in our diagnosis of a mental illness in older adults. Common tests include thyroid, kidney, and liver function, complete blood count, comprehensive metabolic panel, vitamin B12, folic acid, therapeutic drug levels, urinalysis, serology, uh, beta type natriuretic peptide, HIV testing, and computed tomography of the head when indicated. Med reconciliation. In older adults, it is important to perform a systematic review of current medication use known as a med rec. Med rec is the process of developing the most accurate list possible of all medications a patient is taking. This list should include drug name, dose, frequency, and route. The purpose of this process is to reduce adverse incident side effects and potentially lethal combinations. Assessing the use of multiple medications, or polypharmacy, includes prescription, over-the-counter drugs, and herbal agents. Adverse drug reactions or negative responses to drugs are common among the older adult. Older adults are at a greater risk for these events due to multiple medical problems and memory issues that may result in taking too little or too much medication. Renal and liver impairment affect excretion and are associated with dose-related adverse reactions. Metabolic changes and decreased drug clearance compound the risk for drug use interactions. The risk for adverse drug reactions doubles for people taking five to seven medications as compared with those taking fewer than five medications. For people taking eight or more medications, the risk of adverse drug reactions increases by four times. The American Geriatric Society recently updated the criteria for and list of potentially inappropriate medications for older adults. Many psychiatric medications appear on the list, including benzos, anticholinergics, antipsychotics, antidepressants, antiepileptics, and anti-Parkinson's drugs. 
Well, damn. Nurses must be diligent in reviewing seniors' medication lists for completeness. Uh, prescribing cascades happen when drug-induced symptoms are treated with another drug. The provider may assess the side effect of the first drug as part of the original medical problem uh, or a new one. Prescribing cascades are particularly problematic and complicated. One of the most common examples is when a person begins anti-Parkinson therapy for symptoms brought about by antipsychotics. Anti-Parkinson's drug may bring about new and dangerous symptoms such as delirium or orthostatic hypertension. Anticholinesterase inhibitor drugs used to treat dementia, such as denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine, may cause urinary incontinence and diarrhea. These symptoms may result in a prescribing cascade with one uh, use of an anticholinergic, such as oxybutynin, which cause cognitive dulling and confusion. Pharmacists have begun to play a critical role in reviewing and advising on matters of prescribing for the older adult. The American Geriatric Society has updated the beers list and criteria, which was developed in 1991 to identify inappropriate medications for the older adult. Maher et al. identify how polypharmacy affects the older adult. They cite nine negative clinical consequences of inappropriate drug use. One, increased health care costs. Two, adverse drug reactions. Three, drug interactions. Non-adherence. Decline of functional status. Increased cognitive impairment. Increased falls. Increased urinary incontinence. Increased risk of malnutrition. Common problems associated with medication include confusion, which can be caused by anticholinergics and antihistamines and benzos. Psychosis has been linked to the use of levodopa steroids and even cholesterol-lowering medications. Depressive symptoms have been linked with alpha-adrenergics and opiates. Mental status exam. Assessment of the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional status of the older adult is important in managing the nursing care of the patient. Periodic repetition of screening tools serves to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions targeting mood problems. The geriatric depression scale is a subjective yes-no questionnaire and the Cornell Scale for Depression and Dementia is an objective behavioral checklist for caregivers to help identify the presence of depressive symptoms. It's also important to recognize that having thoughts or wishes of death may occur during times of acute medical illness or emotional distress, so it is essential to further assess the suicidal intent and or plans by asking questions such as, have you ever thought about ending your life or wish you didn't wake up? Have you ever felt like life is not worth living? Have you ever tried to hurt yourself in the past? Are you looking for ways to harm yourself? Do you have thoughts of harming others? Do you have any means to harm yourself or others? Weapons, large amounts of meds? This may need to be asked to family members as well. Times when individuals, older adults included, are sick or are in a significant pain, they may verbalize a death wish by saying, I just wish I would die, or if I had a gun, I'd shoot myself. This should never be ignored. Rather, it need be explored. Often people just feel frustrated, desperate, ignored, unheard, or disrespected, but they aren't able to articulate these emotions. Encourage the individual to say more about what he or she is experiencing. Get more information, provide active listening, and offer support. These types of statements and data need to be documented and reported to the care provider. If there are active suicidal thoughts and intent, the individual should not be left alone. Elicit help from other staff and mental health teams. Interventions for the prevention of suicide in older adults are discussed in greater depth later in this chapter. Also refer to Chapter 25 for more detailed discussion of suicide assessment and intervention. The geriatric depression scale here in Box 31.7 has a bunch of yes or no questions, which we can look at later. Driving and the older adults. Older adults living in the community may still be driving, which can become a safety concern for caregivers, family, and the public. There is evidence an older adult can no longer safely drive a vehicle, such as failing visual acuity, hearing loss, cognitive deficits, impaired mobility, or movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, or if there have been occurrences of frequent small collisions or getting lost, it is appropriate to consult with medical providers about further assessment. At times, it's appropriate to notify the State Bureau of Motor Vehicles for a driving evaluation to determine ability or safe operation of a vehicle. Other times, family can be encouraged to facilitate having seniors give up the keys to the car or disable a car so it won't run in the best interest of public safety. 
Older adult abuse. Abuse or exploitation is another area to explore during nursing assessment. Questions about being hit, pushed, kicked, and slapped are important. It is also imperative to inquire about care being withheld. Not being fed, cleaned, health, or cared for is also abuse. Asking, how are you being treated at home? Are you afraid of anyone? may encourage further exploration. Financial exploitation is another issue that is difficult to uncover. Older adults may feel ashamed or embarrassed or admit they have been taken advantage of by family, friends, or strangers. Box 31A provides helpful interview techniques to use with older adults. Topics of older adult violence discussed in depth in Chapter 28. Box 31.8, Health Techniques for Interviewing Older Adults. Gather preliminary data before the session and keep questionnaires relatively short. Ask about often overlooked problems such as difficulty sleeping, incontinence, falling, depression, dizziness, or loss of energy. Pace the interview to allow the patient to formulate answers. Resist the tendency to interrupt prematurely. Use yes or no simple choice questions if the older patient has trouble coping with open-ended questions. Begin with general questions such as how can I help you most at this visit or what's been happening. Be alert for information on the patient's relationships with others, thoughts about families or coworkers, typical responses to stress and attitudes towards aging, illness, occupation, and death. Requests such as tell me uh, about how you spend your days often provides important information. Assess mental status for deficits in recent or remote memory and determine if confusion exists. Be aware of all medications a patient is taking and assess for side effects, efficacy, and possible drug interactions. Determine how fast the condition of the patient has been changing to assess the extent of the patient's concerns. Include the family or significant other in the interview process for added input, clarification, support, and reinforcement. Intervention. The trend for patient-centered care, relationship-based care, and the patient as a participant in care may be foreign concepts to the older adult. Most have experienced medical care as listening to the doctor, regardless of whether or not they agree. A shift in approach may need much reinforcement with the older adult who has been socialized as a passive recipient of health care. Certain psychotherapeutic methods are usually useful for older adults, providing empathetic understanding and active listening, encouraging ventilation of feelings and normalizing emotional responses, reestablishing emotional equilibrium when anxiety is moderate to severe, providing health education, discussing alternative solutions and encouraging questions, assisting in the use of problem-solving approaches, allowing adequate time for to process information, ensuring hearing aids are working, or using an amplifier to facilitate good communication. Providing written information in large print. Psychosocial interventions. The nurse uses counseling skills to assist the patient with exploring the present situation, looking at alternatives, and planning for the future. Sometimes, counseling is provided in a group setting. This approach helps build relationships, provides focus on the here and now, and reduces feelings of isolation. There's growing evidence that physical and mental exercise help maintain and improve cognitive function. Nurses can encourage this activity with cognitive stimulation activities, which may be conducted individually or in groups of five to eight people. This evidence-based approach may result in significant improvement in language skills. Examples of cognitively stimulating activities are word games, puzzles, music, and discussion of past events. Reminiscence is a cognitive stimulation activity that engages seniors in socialization and rapport building. In groups or individually, the nurse can encourage discussion about past pleasant events or memories such as first car, favorite memory from school, favorite band or song, or seasonal activities growing up. Assisting to evoke pleasant feelings or memories is an effective method to improve mood, particularly in those with memory impairment. Psychobiological interventions, pharmacological. Evidence about the biology of mental illness and the discovery of new psychotropic medications has expanded the role of Jero psychiatric nurse. Nurses play a vital role in monitoring, reporting, and managing medication side effects such as acute dystonia, akathisia, pseudo-Parkinsonism, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, serotonin syndrome, and anticholinergic effects. Physical assessment of response to medication is also important. This includes monitoring vital signs, pain, laboratory work, elimination, changes in gait, prevention of falls, and neurological checks when appropriate. Teaching patients and or family about management of medications is a vital part of nursing care. Advanced practice interventions. 
Psychiatric Mental Health Advanced Practice ner Registered Nurses, may provide individual and or group psychotherapy to older adults. Individual modalities such as CBT, motivational interviewing, interpersonal therapy, and psychodynamic therapy are commonly used. Group therapy focuses on instilling hope by diminishing social isolation and loneliness. Group members can learn creative ways to improve mood and increase quality of life. Treatment settings for older adults. Care for older adults may become unmanageable at home. Medical providers are responsible for determining an appropriate level of care. This may range from acute hospitalization to skilled nursing care facility, to adult daycare, to community-based programs, or to respite care. Discussion of several care settings follows. Gero psychiatric units. An older adult may require acute inpatient psychiatric health care for conditions such as acute mental status changes with agitation, psychotic symptoms, major depression with suicidal intent, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Inpatient treatment is recommended when the patient is at risk of self-harm, whether intentional or un unintentional, or poses a risk of harm to other people. Box 31.9, patient and family teaching about drug safety. Learn about your medicines. Read medicine labels and package inserts. Follow directions. If you have questions, ask your nurse, pharmacist, or primary care uh, provider. Talk to your team of healthcare professionals about your medical conditions, health concerns, and all the medicines you take, prescription and over-the-counter, as well as dietary supplements, vitamins, and herbal supplements. The more they know, the more they can help. Keep track of side effects or possible drug interactions, and let your doctor know right away about any unexpected symptoms or changes in the way you feel. Be sure to keep all care provider appointments. Use a calendar pill box or something to help you remember what medications you need to take and when. Write down information your health care provider gives you about your medicines or your health condition. Take a friend or relative to your doctor's appointments if you think you need help to understand or remember what the doctor tells you. Have a medicine checkup at least once a year. Go through your medicine cabinet to get rid of old or expired meds. Ask your healthcare provider or pharmacist to go over all the medicines you now take. Remember to tell them about all the over-counter medicines, vitamins, dietary supplements, and herbal supplements you take. Um, hospitalization may be an opportunity for the patient to receive much-needed assessment of the skin, feet, hair, mouth, and perennial areas. These assessments often can uncover hidden infections, unhealed wounds, and gross that may otherwise have been missed and can lead to needed medical attention. Specialized geropsychiatric units provide a comprehensive and specialized approach to care. These units utilize a multidisciplinary approach to assessment, treatment planning, implementation, and evaluation of care. Ideally, the team consists of registered nurses, geriatric uh, psychiatrists, geriatricians, social workers, pharmacists, psychologists, dietitians, occupational therapists, and physical therapists. One of the major roles of the nurse is milieu management. This involves assisting in adjustment to the environment, keeping the unit safe by making sure roommates are compatible, call lights are within reach, and patients at risk for falling are close to the nurse's station. Recognizing the tone of the unit and making modifications when needed such as reducing noise levels and decluttering areas, are critical roles of the staff nurse. Another vital aspect of nursing is the prevention and reduction of agitation by maintaining a visible presence on the unit and anticipating the patient's needs. Crisis intervention techniques may be necessary if an agitated patient does not respond to redirection or verbal attempts to de-escalate agitation. As a crisis situation unfolds, staff response will largely determine the outcome and a well-trained crisis team improves these outcomes. The crisis team leader is usually a nurse for several reasons. One, nurses provide professional care 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have detailed knowledge of patients and the milieu. Two, the nurse is aware of the patient's medical condition. Three, the nurse is able to guide the team and help prevent injury to the patients who may need physical restraint. After the crisis has been de-escalated, the team leader, the team, and other patients, as indicated, need to discuss the situation. This will help restore a sense of safety and calm. As the agitated patient gains control, it is important to help the individual ease back into the milieu with dignity. Skilled nursing facilities. 
As acute hospital care of older adults with psychiatric illnesses is decreasing, the use of long-term skilled nursing facilities is increasing. The use of these facilities to treat older adults with severe mental illnesses is controversial. Opponents fear that skilled nursing facilities will become the psychiatric institutions of the 21st century, providing little more than custodial care. Whereas some long-term care settings provide specialized psychiatric mental health care or behavioral units, most do not. There may be little consistency in the education of nurses and nursing assistants in appropriate psychiatric assessment and intervention. Staff may believe that patients who refuse personal hygiene, medication, or wound care are exercising their rights to refuse rather than recognizing the negative symptoms of schizophrenia or depression. Nurses who repeatedly accept these refusals without further evaluation may inadvertently contribute to a patient's deterioration. Federal legislation has had a significant impact on the treatment of older adults in extended care facilities. The PSDA of 1990 declared that nursing home residents have the right to be free from unnecessary drugs and physical restraints. Clinicians have begun to focus on the use of non-pharmacological interventions for the treatment of agitation, wandering, confusion, yelling, and aggression. Drugs that are avoided include antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, and sedatives. Nurses can play an important role in advocating for psychiatric evaluation and intervention to assist with one, medication management, two, monitoring and documenting behavioral issues, three, notifying the physician of behavioral changes, and four, planning care for the needs of those residents with mental illness. Due to past inappropriate use of restraints, which led to injuries and deaths, federal legislation regarding their safe use was put into place. The requirements governing the use of restraints include the following. One, consultation with a physical and or occupational therapist. Two, the least restrictive measures must be considered and documented. Three, a, phys a physician's order is required. Four, consent of the resident or family must be obtained. Five, documentation must be provided that the restraint enables the resident to maintain maximum functional and psychological well-being. Assisted living. This setting is utilized when a resident needs minimal assistance with ADLs. Meals are provided as well as 24-hour assistance as needed. Care is tailored to the needs of the resident and care is paid for based on needs. This level of care is usually not covered by insurance and can be quite expensive. There are waiver programs in some states that provide for Medicaid reimbursement. Respite care. Family caregivers are at great risk for burnout. Respite care is designed to allow caregivers to have a break for a specific number of days. During this time, the patient is admitted to a nursing facility for a planned number of days. The family can then go on vacation, travel, or just have a needed break from caregiving. Respite care can also be provided in the home as well. Residential care. As discussed in Chapter 4, the psychiatric care system has increasingly become focused on the goal of community living rather than institutional living, but resources necessary to meet this goal have been chronically underfunded. Patients who would benefit from residential care are often moved from the most structured environment in patient care to unstructured environments. These settings vary greatly, and families and guardians should be educated to investigate what specific services will be provided. Partial hospitalization programs are recommended for ambulatory patients who do not need 24-hour nursing care. They provide structured activities along with nursing and medical supervision, intervention, and treatment. These programs tend to be located within general hospitals and psychiatric hospitals or as part of the community mental health system. Daycare programs, multi-purpose senior centers, provide a broad range of services, including one, health promotion and wellness programs, two, health screening, three, social, educational, recreational activities, four, meals, and five, information and referral services. For those in need of mostly custodial care services, adult daycare is an appropriate choice. Older adults are cared for during the day and stay in a home environment at night. Programs allow older adults to continue their present living arrangements and maintain their social ties to the community. They also relieve families of the burden of 24-hour daycare for older adult dependents. Home health care. Home-based health care assists the homebound older adult 
to adjust to and manage illness and disability either before or after hospitalization. It is often the role of the health home care nurse to help a person affected by a cognitive disorder, medical illness, or a severe and persistent mental illness to remain in the home. The National Association of Area Agencies on Aging assists in providing local home care services such as housekeeping, meal prep, and assistance with aiding else to increase the older adult's ability to live independently. Chapter 4 discusses home, psychiatric, mental health care in greater detail. Community-based programs. Community-based programs are an alternative to promote the older adult's independent functioning and reduce the stress on the family system. These programs provide special case management services that assist older adults with coordination, care, and other supports, such as Meals on Wheels and Transportation. And that is it for this chapter.